Okay, everybody, uh, welcome back uh, to our first uh, first Peter um, study. If you will, if you open your Bibles to First Peter um, chapter two, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, before we get started, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer for the confession of our sins, and then I will open up with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this uh, evening. We want to thank you once again for another day of your grace. Every day we wake up is a grace gift from you. And we just show our gratitude for this day by making time to learn the mind of Christ. Thank you for those believers who have a respect for your word and a love for your truth. And, and, and pray that you will Bless them, meet their needs. We ask that you have set us apart from sin unto yourself so that we can be able to commune and also be able to be taught by God the Holy Spirit. We ask these sins in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And just a quick review of chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 11. We're going to start at verse 11. And what Peter is doing now is showing the believer that he is on a mission or the believers are on a mission in the world. And so in our last uh, class, uh, we saw that as believers in Jesus Christ, uh, that these believers that Peter writing to are on a mission in the world and they have res a responsibility to God and they have a responsibility as individual uh, believers as they live among um, men. In verse 11, we see the mission of the believer in the world is to live a exemplary life um, before unbelievers in, in verse 11 and 12. In verse 11, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. Now, the, the idea here of aliens and strangers uh, show the believer his identity in the world. I heard somebody say we are living in a, a time period where there is an identity crisis meaning believers don't understand their identity or they don't live their life as though they understand that identity. So here, Peter encourages the believer uh, or urged the believer uh, uh, to understand his identity in the world. Uh, our conduct or these believers' conduct in the world um, is to reflect their identity their true identity, that their identity is that of aliens and strangers. Aliens mean that they're foreigners, uh, and strangers mean that they are, they are temporary residents. So the believer's identity uh, in the world is that of foreigners, for, uh, foreigners and strangers or temporary residents. So the world is not the believer's home, and therefore their conduct is to reflect that knowledge. Their conduct is to reflect the knowledge that the world is not their home. And how do they, uh, uh, how do their, their, con their conduct reflect that understanding of their uh, true identity? By abstaining from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. So here, uh, the believer in the world before men is not to indulge in anything that is contrary to the plan and the will of God. Fleshly lust refers to desires of the sin nature or things that appeal to the sin nature. See, uh, these believers, and as well as all believers, will experience temptation as we are here in our temporary residence, 
as we await our true home, our permanent residence, we all will experience temptations that appeals to our flesh, but we are to not give in to the temptation from our flesh, but allow our conduct to reflect our true identity. In 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 16, we see that the world seeks to appeal to our eyes, our flesh, and our pride. In other words, Satan has a system set up in the world to influence our thinking, to lead us in rebellion against God, and to cause us to not live as aliens and strangers. So we are to refuse those things that appeal to the flesh because our status is that of an alien and a foreigner. We're not to take our standards from the culture around us. We're not to take our standard from Satan's world system because our status, our status is that of being citizens of heaven. So we take our standards from heaven. We take our standards from our heavenly home. So our practice should fit the standard of our new home. And this would be our permanent place. Heaven is our permanent residence where only righteousness dwell. So instead of being molded by the culture that is around us, we are to allow our permanent residents to mold us. In other words, we should live righteous lives as we are in our temporary resident, which is in this world. See, the culture around us would like for us to live for the here and now, but as believers, we are not to live for the here and now. We're not to live to gratify our flesh. We're not to be greedy, but be content. We're not to uh, seek those things that make our body feel good, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. We're not to seek those things that look good to the eyes in our greed. We're not to seek to more power and reputation before men because none of those things really matter in our permanent residence. What we should be doing is living according to the standard of heaven. We should not be trying to be accepted by men, but make sure that we're living as those who are accepted by God. We're not to value what the world value. We value what God values. And that is where Peter encourages these believers to do is to live as aliens and strangers. Carry out your new identity in your conduct by abstaining from fleshly lusts with wars against the soul. And then in verse 12, he said, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentile so that the things where they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So here in verse 12 of chapter two, we see Peter goes on in discussing what the believer is to be like in their temporary residence is that before men, their character is to be excellent. They are to uh, live by heavenly standards. And see these believers who are suffering probably were being slandered by the unbelieving world uh, as being evil uh, or the reason for bad things happening. And this led to these believers suffering. But Peter encouraged them that they are to keep their behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that they will put to silence their critics. And see, as believer, 
there are many people who are not going to like us. They're going to criticize us. They're going to speak evil against us. But we should always live a exemplary life before them. And we will put them to put them to silent or to cause them to glorify God. And see, when others speak good of our character or good of our conduct, that brings glory to God. That brings glory to God. Whenever someone speak good about your conduct as a believer in the world, that brings glory to God. And we are to live in a way that when our that that our critics who speak evil against us will be put to shame when they see our conduct, but also they will have to glorify God. And the day that God judges these unbelievers, they will have to glorify God because they see the conduct of the believers in the world. In Matthew 5, go to Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16. Jesus communicated this, this same truth in Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16. Matthew 5, verse 13 through 16. He say, you are the salt of the earth, speaking to his disciple. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it on a basket, but on the lampstand, and they give light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who, was, who, who is in heaven. So as believer, we should always live exemplary life, even if we're suffering at the hands of our critics. We're still to display godly conduct, even in the midst of suffering from our critics. And the critic will have to give glory to God in the day that God judges them. And the day of visitation probably is a reference to the day of judgment or the great white throne judgment seat. So what Peter wants here, or hope here in verse 11 and 12, is that the believer exemplary behavior would change the mind of their accusers. Exemplary behavior before unbelievers should change the mind of those who accuse believers. And see, as Christian, even when we are treated unjustly, then we are still to do good and not evil for evil or try to repay people evil for evil, but we are to overcome evil with good as Romans 12, verse 17 to 21 say. Let's go to Romans 12, verse 17 through 21. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Romans 12, 17 through 21. One of my favorite practical uh, few verses here is Verse 17 say, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Re respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. But it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, say the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, excuse it, for, for in so doing, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So here the believer behavior should always be that of an example of righteousness so that we may change the mind of those who accuse us. In other words, we're to show grace even to those who are the cause of our suffering. We're to show them grace and not take matters in our own hand by taking revenge. Also, speaking of how the believer is to be in the world, in verse 13, uh, particularly 13 through 17, we see that in the world, the believer is to have respect for authority and a respect for all people. So in the world, not only is believers to live as alien strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts and keeping a exemplary behavior, but they're also, is, they're, they're also encouraged to respect authority and respect all people. Now, this is a section that rebellious people and arrogant people probably hate, but if you're a believer who desire to do the will of God and to be blessed by God and be rewarded by God, take heed to these verses, uh, starting in verse uh, 13 through 14. Keep in mind, as a Christian, these believers live in hostile territory. The world is a very hostile place for Christians to live in because Satan is the God of this world and he influences unbelievers and that makes the world a very hostile environment for believers in Jesus Christ. And we have to live with that in mind. In verse 13 through 14, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoer and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may sound the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for sin, but use it as bond slaves of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So here we see that what the Christian relationship should be as it relates to state and civil government. This word translated in verse 13, submit, means to be in subjection, to be in subjection. And this is a command, is in the imperative mood, the mood of command, to submit oneself. Here we see the command for the believer to submit to civil authority. The believer is to submit to civil authority for the Lord's sake. In other words, and notice say, uh, after submit, submit yourself for the Lord's sake. You're seeking to honor, these believers seek to honor God. Submit for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Now the every human institution, human is that which is made by human or uh, perceived from human. Now how do the believers submit to governmental ruler, rulers? Well, it's very simple, obey them. Obey them because governmental institutions or these institutions of authority is created by God. And therefore, we are to respect and obey the governing authorities, civil authorities, because this system of government is created by God. Hold your hand at verse 13 and go back to Romans 13. And we see another author communicating the same truth, and that is Paul to the Roman in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 1. He say, every person 
is to be in subjection to the governing authority. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists, resists authority has opposed the ordinances of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation on themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of rabbit, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rules or servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due of them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor and respect to those who deserve honor and respect. And then if you go to 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2, 1 Timothy 2, Verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and uh, verse uh, 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy 2 read, first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayer, petition, thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So it pleases God when believers submit and obey God's legitimate institution of governmental rulers. Also look at Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Titus 3, verse 1 and 2. And Titus 3, verse 1 and 2 reads, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceful, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. But here's the deal. Individuals and in places of government are in positions of authority. They may not be worthy of the Christian's obedience, especially if they are part of the reason the Christian is suffering. They may not be worthy of our obedience, but we are told to be obedient, not because they are worthy of our obedience, but because the Lord commands us to do so. We just saw the word of God commands us to do so, so there should be no conditions to respect and obedience to authority. We should do it because the Lord commands us to do so. We should not say, I'm not going to respect and obey this authority figure because they're not worthy of my obedience and my respect. And we see that if we resist authority, we're resisting God's divine institution. So this is how the believer is to live in the world as aliens and strangers. They are to obey every human institution, every forms of legitimate authority, whether to king as the one in authority. Christ and his humanity gave respect to even evil 
human rulers. Christ gave respect to even evil human rulers. He is our example of respecting God's divine institution of government, of authority. And so Peter reminds the Christian suffering that government has a purpose. God has a purpose for government. Well, let's see the purpose for government, God's purpose for government. Go to verse 14, back at 1 Peter 2, verse 14. What is God's purpose for government? What is God's purpose for government? What is God's purpose for those in authority? Verse 14, or to govern as sent as to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. So here we see that one of the purposes of government are those in authority, whether it be law enforcement, is punishment of evildoers for the preservation of the human race. So God used government to punish evildoers. And then two, Verse 14, praise of those who do right. He used government to praise or reward those who do right. Now, yes, there is corruption within government. There is corruption among those who've been given authority. But we're still to see the institution of government the institution of authority as legitimately divine sent from God or is God divine institution. Another reason for government and those in authority, they are to provide law and order. They're to bring harmony out of chaos. We need law and order. Without it, the human race would not survive. Without it, there will be no order. It will only be chaos. Therefore, we are to respect authority. Respect even evil authority. Now, there is a place, though, for disobedience to authority. Anybody know when is it? legitimate to disobey those in authority? When is it legitimate to disobey those in authority? Anybody? Whenever it breaks God's law. Amen. Whenever obeying civil government leads to disobedience to God, we're to disobey the civil government. Remember in... Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 19 through 20, when the leaders or the government authority, or the, the, the authority, the, the, um, the uh, Sadducees and the scribes, they threatened Peter and John and told them that they're not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And what did they say in verse 19? And twin, they say, what well, is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God? You be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So they, so the Sadducees and the scribes and the elders and the rulers in Israel, they had positions of authority. But yet they had, they was making a law that made it illegal to obey God. So law that make it illegal to obey God is to be disobeyed. Laws that make it, you know, like during COVID, the government made laws that made it illegal for us to assemble in local churches for worship. What are we to do? We're to disobey. <laughs> because the scriptures say, forsake not the assembly, 
of your sale together at the manner of some. So we are to contend to meet for worship and the study of the word of God. But here's the deal though, keep in mind, if you do disobey civil government, you will have to bear the consequence of your disobedience. It may lead to a fine, it may lead to prison, but we wanna make sure that we avoid unnecessary punishment from the government. Let it be legitimate punishment in obedience to God and not for any other reason. Long as the government is not making laws that make it illegal, illegal to obey God, we're to obey the government. We're to obey authority. We're to avoid unnecessary criticism by obeying the laws as Christians, long as they don't make it illegal for us to obey God. Jesus paid taxes, why? So that people would have nothing bad to say about him. So no one would be able to criticize him. And he even told his disciple to pay taxes. Even though the Roman official used taxes for purposes contrary to the will of God, they still were to pay taxes. See, retaliation to government of those in authority is not wise, even if they're evil, even if they're abusing their authority. It's not wise to retaliate against civil government or those in authority, even if they're abusing their authority and they're evil. Go back to First uh, Peter, chapter two, next verse. First Peter two, next verse, verse uh, sixteen. Sixteen say, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. So here we see that the believer should live as free men. See, a free man live with the family of the free, uh, the family that freedom, but he also take the family name. He's in debt, indebted to him always and to show respect for the one that gave him his freedom. Well, here we see that we are to act as free men and, and do not use our freedom as a covering for evil, but we'll use it as a bond slave of Christ. In other words, we are to, the, the believers are to live their life as slaves of Christ. In other words, they have no will of their own. They live to carry out the will of the one who set them free. So we have social responsibilities. And now in verse 17, we see four, of our, four more of our social responsibilities. Look at these four social responsibilities. Responsibility number one, honor all people. Honor all people. Respect everyone. Why are we to respect everybody? Because one, all men are made in the image of God, no matter their character. See, we may think that some people are worthy of more respect than others, depending on their race, depending on their social status, depending on their behavior. But we're to honor the principle that all men are created by God in the image of God. So we are to honor all men based on that principle, not based on their character. Just like a, you know, I could have a, 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 a daddy that always get him drunk and he don't talk to my, my mom uh, uh, how he's supposed to talk to her when he's drunk but I still respect him 
because he's my father, he's my dad. I respect the principle. And, and, and just like there are some women who are married to husbands that don't always say the nicest thing to them or don't always treat them uh, uh, with respect or with dignity, but they're still to respect the institution. So we're to respect everyone, no matter what their character is. And then we're to love the believers. See, so we're called to respect everybody, but we're called to love believers with unconditional love because in John 13, uh, 35, it says, by this, all men would know that you are my disciples when you love one another. But as it relates to believers, we are to show sacrificial, selfless love for every believer in Jesus Christ. With the sacrifice, lay our life down for one another. But then our other social responsibility is we are to fear God. These believers to fear God, live in reverence for God. And then, last, and then four, in verse 17, honor and respect the king. In other words, love your enemies. Love your enemies with unconditional love. Have respect for the institution of authority. Have respect for the institution. See, it's hard to do this, though, because sometimes the king or the governing official could be the cause of our suffering. But we're to respect the office. We're to respect their office and the institution that God set up. So that means that respect for authority is not to be conditional. We're to give unconditional respect to those who are in authority because it is an institution of God. Verse 18, servants, household slaves, be submissive to your master with all respect. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Here the servants are told to be submissive to their masters. In other words, put yourself under the master's orders. Obey him. Not just to those who are good master, but even the bad one, you're to put yourself under their authority and obey them because of their position in their office. Christian character and integrity is truly seen when you submit to those in authority, even when you're being treated unjustly. That is when you see real Christian character and integrity. When you're treated unjustly and yet you maintain your integrity, you still respect the principle of authority. And why do you respect? Uh, the principle of authority because you have a reverence for God who gave you the command to respect the principle of authority. Verse 19 say, for this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears on his sorrows when suffering unjustly. So the believer are suffering at the hands of authority figures civil authorities, but they submit to authority, to the rulers in fear of God. They respect God's institution of authority and government. So they bear under sorrows when suffering unjustly. And this shows the true nature of their character because they're treated unjustly, but yet they continue to 
have reverence for God and they respect those in authority because it is an institution that was established by God. In verse 20, it says, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? What reward is there if you sin and you are treated harshly? You get what you deserve. But when you do what is right and suffer for it patiently and endure it, this find favor with God because this proves your character. See, God is honored when we maintain our integrity and our character, still live exemplary lives, even in the midst of suffering unjustly. They say that finds favor with God. And then in verse 21, we see who's our example. Jesus Christ is our example of this gracious attitude. Jesus Christ is our example of this gracious attitude. For you have been called for this purpose. Wow. You mean to tell me I have been called to suffer? Yes, you've been called to suffer as a believer, is what Peter is saying. You've been called to suffer because the goal of the Christian life is to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be like him. When people see you, they say, he looks like Jesus. He reflects Jesus' character. He's dealing with things how Jesus deals with things. Verse 21 says, for you have been called for this purpose, and Christ also suffered for you. He suffered for you. Now you may be called upon to suffer for him. And when you suffer for him as a Christian, then you're to do exactly what he did when he suffered for you. What did he do? For you have been called for this purpose and Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his step, who committed no sin, nor was in the deceit found in his mouth. So even when we're treated unjustly, we're not to sin. We're to maintain our conduct, our character, our integrity. We should not allow anybody to cause us to act out of character, no matter what they're doing to us. Verse, 20, verse 23, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wound you were healed. For you were continuing straight like sheep, but now you have to return to the ship and go to your soul. So Christ suffered for us. And when he suffered, he maintained his integrity because if he had acted out of character, he would not have been qualified to be the savior of the world. But Christ endured suffering unjustly for our benefit. And now we may suffer in, the, in this hostile world, but we're never to compromise our character due to our suffering. We're still to live in reverence for God, obey his command, live exemplary lives, even in the midst of suffering unjustly. We're to respect all people. We're to love one another. We're to fear God, honor the king, and respect all divine institutions, even if those in authority is the reason for our suffering. We're still to obey them long as they're not encouraging or making it illegal for us to obey God. Speaking of that, go to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 say, in the same way, now I want you to note this phrase here, in the same way. It could be translated likewise, in like manner, referring to the passage on slaves and also the, the, the verse we just read about submission to authority. Likewise, you wives, 
be submissive to your own husbands so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chastity and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality, of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former time, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husband, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. So here we see that submission of wives to their husband should be viewed in light of the society of that day. So in light of the wild activity of women in the worship services, women are to submit to their husband unconditionally. Women are to submit to their husband unconditionally. Unconditionally, they are to uh, submit to their husband. Only to their husband. Um, so even if the husband is being disobedient. So uh, women are not to put condition on their respect for their husband. They're not going to say, well, I will respect him when he's being obedient to God. When his behavior changed, then I will respect him. Well, according to this verse, we're to, the wives are to give unconditionally respect for, uh, to their husbands. Unconditional. So they're to be submissive to their own husband. They're to, they're to uh, subordinate themselves and allow the man to have the place of leadership and authority over them, even if they are being disobedient to the word. Long as the husband is not making it illegal for you to obey God, you're to obey your husband. And being disobedient, is in subordination, uh, um, uh, and this is not us living exemplary lives before men if the wife is not being in submission to the husband. And submission to the husband is actually in reverence for God. It's in reverence for God who set up this institution called marriage. God is the one who set up that, the institution of marriage and authority. And they say that women make themselves attractive or to make themselves attractive through their obedience and their respect for their husband, their respect for God's institution. That is what makes them so attractive is when they're submissive to their husbands. And, but the men don't get off the hook because if you look at verse uh, seven, in verse seven, men don't get off the hook either because they're called to live exemplary lives too. In verse seven, say, you husband in the same way, likewise. Live with your wives in an understanding way and with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor, show her respect as fellow heirs of the grace of life so that your prayer will not be hindered. A lot of men's prayers go unanswered, unanswered when they don't treat their wife with dignity, respect, and live with them in an understanding way. In other words, being sensitive to the needs of their wives. Weaker here may be weaker in a physical sense. So men have to live in light of that and live and show the wife respect. And if not, your prayers will go unanswered. Stop praying. 
if you're going to show disrespect to your wife, if you're not going to show her honor, stop praying because your prayer will not be answered. She is the fellow heir, the joint heir of the grace of life. And so husband is told too, and, and even husband respect for their wives is to be out of their reverence for God and obedience to God. This is how we are to live before men as aliens and strangers in this world. We're to live by heaven standards, not the culture around us standards. And see, the culture tell wives that your husband got to win your respect. Husband, your, 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 your wife is to respect you, but you're not to respect your, your wives. But we're, we're, we're alien strangers of this world. We're to live by a heavenly standard and not the standard forced upon us by the culture around us. Submission to your husband, like Sarah did, that's old school. That's for old women. We live in a different age now. Well, God said that is attractive. Instead of spending time adorning your outward appearance, trying to be attractive to nice clothes and earrings, make yourself attractive by having respect for your husband. Husband, if you want your prayers to be answered, honor your wife. Treat her as the weaker vessel if you want your prayers to be answered. All right, and then in verse eight, verse eight, we got about five, five uh, minutes. To sum up, to sum it up. Now this word, this phrase here, sum it up, could be finally. In other words, here Peter is, is, is bringing a fresh point or, or, or summarizing what just went before. And, and then he also make a transition here with some statements on Christian character. So he's saying, to sum it up, all of you be harmonious. Be harmonious, all of you. Share in the feelings of others. Be united alike in sorrows and in joy. Be sympathetic. Be united in being harmonious, mean be united in being sympathetic for one another. Brotherly, kind hearted. Humble in spirit, humble mindedness, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving blessing instead. For you were called for this very person that you might inherit a blessing. In verse 10, desire life to love and see good days. The one who desires life, love. And see good, and to love and see good days. So if you want life, you want to uh, 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 see good days. Keep your tongue from evil, and your lip from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous; His ears are attend to their prayer. For the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God faces against those who do evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteous, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sin once and for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirit now in prison, 
who once were disobedient, when the patient of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saved you, not to remove a dirt from flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities, power have been subject to him. All right, so that's chapter three. And so the encouragement is very simple. Live out your identity in the world before men. You are a stranger and you're not to live as the culture dictate you should live, but we are to live exemplary lives by submitting to authority, by honoring all people, by loving all believers, by living in reverence for God, and by following Christ's example, by suffering, but yet maintaining our integrity and our godly behavior. Submission to authority and doing what God wants us to do and commands us to do should be unconditional. It should not be any condition on our obedience to God. Wives should not put condition on their respect for their husband, and husbands are not to put conditions on them respecting their wives. If so, their prayers would go hindered. Any questions or comment? We're closing prayer. Any questions or comment? Any questions or comment? All right, well, Jim, if you don't mind, you can close us out with a word of prayer. All right. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. I ask that you be with each and every family that's been represented here tonight, Lord. Be with the ones that are not able to be here. I know that there are some that are sick. Uh, I just lift up uh, Miss Bay to the Lord for healing. I ask that you will continue to be with Keithian and his family. Watch over them. Be with Becky and her family, Father, as they'll be traveling tomorrow. I praise you and thank you for the protection. And I thank you for your word, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and for your Holy Spirit that leads and directs. Continue to guide us in your word. And thank you, Father for the many blessings you pour out on us each and every day. And may that, our, that everything that we say and do be pleasing to thee. And we ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.